Welcome to The Response, a show about how communities respond to disaster. We started to post all of our interviews on YouTube, so in addition to the podcast, you can follow us here. Please make sure to subscribe, let us know what's on your mind in the comments, and follow at Response Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Today, we're happy to have Mina Poliniapin joining us on The Response. Mina is the founder and CEO of Atma Connect, an award-winning organization building the digital infrastructure to connect people together so they can share vital information and create bottom-up change. She's an Ashoka Fellow, Fulbright Fellow, and awardee of the Million Lives Club. Since 2014, Mina has led Atma Connect to become a globally recognized technology company, focusing on helping vulnerable people connect neighbor to neighbor by sharing actionable information and solutions, taking collective action, and building community resilience. Atma Connect built and deploys Atma Go, a neighborhood level mobile app in Indonesia and Puerto Rico for users to share real-time information and solutions to better prepare for disasters, to improve their access to basic needs, and to address chronic vulnerabilities. Atma Go has reached over 10 million people in Indonesia, Puerto Rico, and Ukraine. Hi, Mina, welcome to The Response. Thank you so much, great to be here. Yeah, so I mean, this conversation, I think, has been a long time coming. I think that we first got connected back in 2019 after we began screening our film, How Puerto Ricans Are Restoring Power to the People. And I've been meaning to have you on the show ever since then. So since many of our listeners and viewers may not be familiar with your work, could you just kind of start by sharing a little bit about your path and the genesis story of Atma Connect? Yeah, absolutely. So I... Have, I'm an environmental engineer by training and had been working early in my career on environmental justice issues around the country and working on international water and sanitation. And I was in India working on a water and climate project. And you know, just over the last decade, what had been happening is that People still didn't have water and sanitation, but increasingly they had mobile phones. And mm -hmm. so really was got on this journey to, to say, how can we use this ubiquitous technology to make visible the invisible, right? So the invisible urban poor who still didn't have water and sanitation to give them a way to be heard and seen and their needs met. And so I started a project in Indonesia, which was called Water SMS, a way for urban poor people to text in information on their water service issues and needs mm -hmm. and have that be crowdsourced mapped in ways that it would be unignorable to local water utilities and local governments. And in that project, um, I learned a lot of things. One is that it's really when you have that the way mobile phones are being used in development was to tell people what to do or to collect information from people, especially poor people, in the service of larger institutions and organizations. And there really was nothing out there that really saw these people on the front lines as brilliant, ingenious, powerful, and gave them a way to connect with each other so they can build their collective power. And I wanted, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do create multi-directional peer-to-peer -peer communication that was really focused on the person living in the vulnerable community or who in the ignored community. And that's how I started the journey. And I also was really obsessed with scale, mm. just, well, in our in the backyard in the Bay Area, it was like Facebook has reached billions of people. Twitter's reached billion people. Yet we don't have a technology for good platform that's reached a billion people. Why not? And so I I just learned from kind of what uh, how they were doing it, which was taking a human centered design approach, taking a lean startup approach, and just really like having no attachment to what we were building because ultimately the user is the, is the customer and they're the ones that need to lead. And so we initially launched the first version of Atmago as a way for urban poor people to share water price information in Jakarta, in Indonesia, in 2014. And we kept asking our users. At this point, we've done thousands of human-centered design interviews, but we were doing it at the beginning too. 
And we kept asking our users, how can we make this better for you? And people said, I'm not sure I'm going to change my water service provider, you know, for, for price reasons, but I am interested in sharing a lot more than just water prices with my neighbors. And so we threw away what we had developed, which a lot of nonprofit tech projects just don't do. And we said, let's build what you want. <laughs> There's no <laughs> point in building what you don't want. And so we relaunched as a hyper local social network and immediately people started using it during the chronic flooding in Jakarta. Mm -hmm. This happens every year and people started using it to share photos of flooded streets. They posted locations of government flooding shelters. They were really providing moral support to each other. To the residents of Bukit Duri, we can get through this together. And once the floods were, were there, reaching out and warning each other to watch out for signs of waterborne disease in children. And so there was this entire ecosystem of information that we didn't even know was missing in disaster. And, and it was just, it was just incredible to see this, this paradise built in hell, which is yeah. like the connections. And ultimately I think we, we talk about first responders, but your neighbors are really the next responders. Like they're the ones that are going to be there. There's the, after we saw what was happening, looking at the academic research, and seeing that in all of these disasters over where, which was done post-disaster, mm -hmm. finding that communities that were better connected experienced less mortality, morbidity, mm -hmm. and disaster. So that was, it was, it's just been an incredible journey seeing, yeah, the birth of that power. Yeah. And if you found, I mean, I know there's the that kind of landmark study that was done after the Chicago heat waves. Yeah. In the mid '90s, which showed that there was other studies that have happened after, after the triple disaster Sandy. after Sandy, the triple disasters in Japan. Yes, um, yes. And how is have you been been able to track that impact in Jakarta and other places as well? Yes, absolutely. And I'm really excited that we were able to build on this evidence. So one of the one of the key things is early warnings. How do mm -hmm. we get early warnings to people in ways that are trusted that people take action on? And so what we started, what we did is we connected with government early warning systems and created peer-to-peer -peer hazard warnings. And Qualcomm, one of our donors, did an independent evaluation of Atmago and the impact of it during disasters mm -hmm. and interviewed 350 people, Atmago users, non-users, and quantified the impact, the economic impact, mm -hmm. the mor mortality, morbidity impact of disasters over the past five years. And they, um, they asked people who are Atmago users what mm -hmm. they did as a result of an early warning on Atmago. They warned their na neighbors, they evacuated their families, they moved valuables, and at scale, at a scale of a million people, this every year, this was over $100 million in economic losses avoided and over 6,000 years of healthy life saved. So it was an incredible, um, it was an incredible validation of what we've been seeing happening and how incredible this mutual support and disaster is yeah, to protect the things that we, the people. Yeah and things that we love the most. And our communities and the places yeah. and everything. Yeah. I mean, I think so a lack of communication and misinformation is usually a problem during disruptions of, of all different kinds. And, and oftentimes it's benign in nature happening as a result of high stakes disasters that they pre present. But there can also be nefarious reasons for that with select individuals and groups looking out for their own interests rather than those of their entire communities. And longtime listeners of The Response will remember that we did an, a documentary about the 2017 Puebla earthquake uh, in Mexico City, and there was rampant misinformation. There was a, a very more well-known story <clears throat> about a little girl named Frida Sofia who didn't actually exist, but for many, many, many hours, it was said that she had been trapped underneath a school that had collapsed. And, I mean, there was international rescue groups that were coming from Israel, I think from Japan, from all over the place. And yet there was nobody under the, rub the rubble and they spent days. It was on national television. It was all over the place. And it may have just been misinformation. The, I guess one of the rescue dogs 
was named Frida. And so it was, was that somehow where that name came from? Also, the school had the owner, it was a private school, and she built a whole addition on top of it that was non permitted and not structurally sound. And she actually tried to escape the country while this was happening. And so there was this question about whether or not this, this kind of this story was driven so that she could get away from the, from the space. So there was some definitely some obfuscation going on. But I tell this story because there is this lack of trust that comes happening. And that was a word that you just, you just brought it up. And especially right now with everything going on at Twitter and this history of misinformation that's been spread on Facebook, I'm wondering kind of what, have, what has happened differently with AtmaGo that has enabled so much trust from its users? Yeah, that is a great question. And I, so we've done surveys with our users and found that 91% of users trust the information on Atmago. And because it's coming from their neighbors, people mm -hmm. in communities, they, that's the first layer of it is our, our tagline, the sort of the core of the organization, which is neighbors helping neighbors, mm -hmm. people helping people. It's, yeah. And our users have said that that really affects the kind of information they put on Atmago, that they think, is this helping my neighbors? And one of our users said, all the other social media is like ego media. What am I wearing? What am I doing? Atmago is something different. It, it gives me a way to help other people. And there's like no better heartwarming like quote than that. It was... Yeah. It's incredible. And that's really how people see it. This is theirs. And it's for them to create better communities, better lives. And that's the, the first layer is just the, the, the very like, core of the organization. And the second is that we have all of the content on Atmago is curated. So we mm. have a human in Indonesia that is curating this information, humans, many humans that are curating this information. We have community ambassadors in locations throughout Indonesia that are curating the information. Mm -hmm. So it is real people on the ground that are ensuring the veracity of the content that's on Atmago and that it's not divisive or mm -hmm. inflammatory. So our user guidelines are very much about, is this helping? others? Mm. Is it promoting tolerance and inclusion? And, um, and what's on there is really a signal to the new content that's added by users. So I, I always ask this question or tell the story that I heard during the genocide in Myanmar that Facebook was implicated in, mm -hmm. guess how many Facebook employees were on the ground or were employed in Myanmar? Yeah. Zero. 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 Yeah. And I think that we really need to remember that technology is a tool for improving our connections in, in the 3D and in this on Earth. And so mm -hmm. how do we, yeah, how do we make sure that it, it plays that role and it doesn't become sort of a, a virtual space in itself that is going division and conflict and tearing the social fabric. So yeah. that is really fundamental is ensuring that the information is trusted. And I, I'll, I'll tell a story. So during yeah. COVID, there's obviously so many stories about the misinformation that was being spread on the traditional social media platforms. And we created within two weeks, a, a special microsite on COVID, which had the official information from the government. It connected people to resources like in different stages of the disaster in Indonesia, ambulances and oxygen beds were in really short supply. So finding, getting access to those things and provided free telecounseling. Women and children were heavily impacted by the pandemic. Domestic violence cases really increased during the lockdowns, especially in Asia. And this was a way for people to get very accessible, free online help. Additionally, we created a sort of community voices. So during different stages of the pandemic, where first it was, this is a hoax, COVID is a hoax. Mm -hmm. And so having like real people from different places throughout Indonesia talk about 
that they that they got COVID or how they were dealing with business closures and sort of turning that into an opportunity for creativity versus um, conflict and mm -hmm. division. Later stages in the pandemic, it was about uh, addressing vaccine hesitancy. So having not government officials, but you know, real people on the ground in different communities of different ethnic backgrounds talk about to share mm -hmm. their story of getting the vaccine and why they did it. And it was this sort of peer to peer information sharing that I think really pierces the the information bubble. Mm -hmm. The misinformation bubble. The mis yeah. And I'm wondering how in addition to that kind of spreading that information, I'm wondering kind of how the the platform has kind of changed over time. I, I noticed that you kind of refer to it as a as a mutual aid tool. And I'm wondering kind of how that has manifested itself on Atma Go. Yeah. So a few changes. So one or, or so a few evolutions mm -hmm. of the platform. So at the beginning, it was really the incredible impact it had during disaster response and recovery. People were rebuilding together. They were helping each other find food and water, shelter in the hours after disaster. What was really exciting to me is how they started moving into the mitigation area and people were organizing events to plant mangrove trees. Mm -hmm to reduce the impact of flooding from sea level rise and wave events. And they were clearing, cleaning garbage, organizing biweekly garbage cleanups in dense urban areas, which reduced the impact of flooding. So mm -hmm. the stormwater drains were cleared. So there were, there were so many ways in which people were taking prevention into their own hands and taking collective action to ensure that we were preventing the severity of the next disaster. That was incredible. They were also gathering together to advocate with governments. So whether it was, we need this river desilted or we, um, we need to monitor government budgets and sort of make sure that the infrastructure that's needed is being funded. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's incredible how this is, uh, it's connecting to so many other things and the way that people are taking collective action to actually create the future that they want versus reacting to these terrible situations. So that's mm -hmm. been incredible and ways that we've been helping to support those efforts. So one of the things that we've created that I'm really excited about in the last two years is looking at sort of our highest value users, like the folks that were posting the most content, that were the most engaged. These were community leaders, often of informal groups, not they weren't registered mm -hmm. as a nonprofit, in places like Indonesia or Puerto Rico, and yet they were the ones that were spearheading these activities, creating events. Mm -hmm. And we, we started talking to them. How can we make this more valuable and useful for you? Mm -hmm. And it was clear they had a few things that, they, that were really important for them. One is engaging, activating their communities, getting more supporters for their cause. Second, learning from other community leaders. And third is being able to access financial support for their work and to be able to do that by creating an, a, a resume of the impact that they were having, mm -hmm. quantifying mm -hmm. and providing photos and evidence and stories about that impact. And so we created a community impact platform where we now have 200 organizations, small organizations, mm -hmm who are having discussions with their members about what, what should the next activity be or how can we address this issue around flooding or how can we empower women entrepreneurs and creating events and documenting these actions in ways that we can start seeing all of these thousands, millions of points mm -hmm. of light and start connecting them in ways that it can become a force that magnetizes financial resources from um, institutions that are looking to, to, to fund that kind of impact. Yeah. And I, I think what I'm kind of hearing from you too, is that this is a really good example of what movement generation refers to as permanently organized communities that, that need to be able to 
be already working together so that in advance of a disaster or when a disaster comes, they're in a better position to advocate for their needs to public officials and to the outside world to, to garner support when necessary, but also to be able to help kind of support long lasting change coming out of that disaster so that the communities don't face the exact same thing again and again and again, which we see, especially in, in marginalized communities where there aren't the same amount of resources that, that may be in other communities. And so it sounds like the platform, you've been able to kind of use it to achieve a, a goal similar to that. Absolutely. Yes, it is that. we. So I, I define resilience as bouncing back better, bouncing mm -hmm. back stronger. And that's fundamentally what we need to do is sort of take it from responding to this to this disaster to creating um, creating an even more resilient community mm -hmm. in the future and a, a better organized community through collective action and these connections that are going to reduce the impact of the next disaster and ultimately change the change, change the frame right mm -hmm. so that mangrove trees for example not only uh, reduce the impact of flood events, they they also store carbon. And so how can we fund both of those things together? Okay. Here's a, a, we need to do that. The communities that are on the front lines of climate change and experiencing these extreme weather events had the least to do with the amount of carbon that's causing this level of disruption. And without a doubt, any resources that are available from the international community need mm -hmm. to go to these frontline communities yep. so that they can invest in the resilient infrastructure and solutions that are gonna protect their communities and also mitigate carbon. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, I think, and right now, a lot of that's being talked about in, in Egypt mm -hmm. and there is this reluctance of the global north to, to kind of pay the fair share to help mitigate the, the, the great harm that is happening right now in the global south that is only going to increase. And I, there's a number of different levers. I mean, we talk about the, the larger policy levers. We talk about community organizers that are pushing for this work. And I understand that you're also kind of working on this, these kind of environmental sustainability and, and opportunity from kind of getting investment and support as well. Just wondering how that's kind of, I think that kind of speaks to what you're talking about with the mangroves. Yeah, absolutely. So what we, what we have so far, what we have now is this community impact platform mm -hmm. and a dashboard that is aggregating this impact at scale, how many trees have been planted. And the next phase is to get, um, get funding into this and mm -hmm. to help these communities that, Forests. So one of the approaches that we're really excited about right now that we're putting together with a coalition of organizations is how can we align economic incentives for forest communities? And this is absolutely the number one driver of deforestation. Over 90% of deforestation in, in, the, in the Amazon, in, the, in Congo, in Indonesia is driven. It's illegal and it's driven by livelihood needs. Yeah. And we need to we need to solve this it's the right thing to do it's it's the most effective solution for de deforestation and it's the way that it really sees and solves the needs of communities mm -hmm. in forest communities and what we are creating and technology is really has moved to this point in the last few years where we're talking about Web 3.0, which mm -hmm. everyone is a co-creator in Web 3.0 and being a framework where people in forest communities can share their stories, their ideas, their photos, their solutions, and have that be funded in ways that will change, change the economic incentives for deforestation. And that initial funding then moves into how can we start funding, not through microfinance or loans, but through injecting capital to help these, these individuals start and grow forest aligned businesses. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think the, um, this is really a transformative solution to this that is not about having 
money flow into carbon markets where it's not reaching mm -hmm. communities and the people that are most affected. But l let's get it to the to the front line. And that's 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 our goal. And it sounds like a an upstream solution, which is, I think, in alignment a little bit with the a, a recent audio documentary that actually our partners over at the Upstream podcast have done investigating kind of the difference between kind of a Green New Deal and a, and a green capital perspective and kind of dive, dives into those those larger economic factors, those community factors and the, the, and the environmental factors that that really are kind of in a, in a push pull relationship between those two things. I'm kind of I know you, you mentioned that we just kind of started talking a little bit about how you are looking beyond Jakarta. And I know the, the platform has now grown beyond Jakarta in the last number of years. And starting with, with Puerto Rico, which is, again, a way that we first got connected because it's a, the disaster that was Hurricane Maria is one of the things that inspired us actually to start this show. In that year of 2017, when there was, I think, 16 major disasters in the United States alone, causing thousands of, of lives to be lost and, and trillions of dollars of damage. And and so I'm I'm wondering kind of how the the platform is kind of looks and feels on the ground in in Puerto Rico and how people are using it there. Yeah, that's yeah, really exciting to talk about Puerto Rico and and I can I can say a little bit about Ukraine too. Puerto Rico has been um, has been really amazing and in in some ways unique. In that we in Puerto Rico, what we really have focused on is community leaders, many of whom are women and many of whom are involved in addressing one of the big issues that became visible after Hurricane Maria, which was food insecurity. And it, it varies, but over 80 percent of the food in Puerto Rico was imported. And this is this is a is a big issue and so what we've been doing is helping to support community gardens and farmers to share their strategies and approaches across the island and really create this uh sharing of best practices mm -hmm. and create communities of best practice we also created a Adad program where community lead, and we did this with the national park service as a partner and it was a way for community leaders throughout Puerto Rico to, to talk about the past, present, and future of their communities. And it was, it, was, it was a really incredible series in terms of the diversity of community leaders that were profiled and how much they enjoyed all interacting together in sort of like the, the compendium event and how much more we need of that, because sometimes this can feel like a lonely road. And yet when we brought community leaders together from Indonesia and Puerto Rico, it was incredible. Despite all the translation issues, there was so much energy and so much commonality in the their struggles and their celebrations. So it was it was incredible. We, we need we need more of it because it is. It is lonely sometimes swimming upstream, yeah. uh, working to create change in in places. So yeah, it's been really, yeah, really heartwarming. Yeah, and then in Ukraine because I know that's where you've mobilized most recently after the Russian invasion. I think in the last few months, right? And and earlier this year we did an audio documentary about Ukraine, kind of and the kind of exploring the the forced displacement of the Ukrainian people and what mutual aid looks like during wartime. And it was very much focused on kind of that initial evacuation, like people either moving to other to the far corners, western corner of, of Ukraine or moving into other countries like Moldova and kind of how people were welcomed, how they were able to sustain that work, how they were able to support their, the populations and kind of what that was looking like at that stage, really in the first few months of, of this man-made crisis. And here we are today, we're, we're moving in towards fully into winter. I think there was, it was snowing yesterday, I think below zero degrees. There's, it's now kind of a compounding disaster on the ground in, in Ukraine, not only just the, just the war, but the fact that so much of the infrastructure has been destroyed, the energy crisis, people are thinking, are hearing a lot about that. I know a project that we've been a little bit a, a part of on, on the peripheral in 
Petaluma, California, are running a solidarity action and getting people to reduce their consumption of resources in Petaluma to mirror the consumption that's happening in Ukraine. So there's, a, there's, there's awareness about it and using it as an opportunity to build awareness about what's going on the ground. And with this kind of new phase of, again, that man-made disaster that is war in Ukraine, I'm wondering how Atmago is, is kind of being implemented there. Yeah, that yeah, it it's it's interesting and those crises that you've talked about are certainly changing for a technology it, it we we do have like low bandwidth and all of these things integrated into the technology and it's all of those things are real and have an impact. So we really did want to focus on internally displaced people mm-hmm. and the need to uh as they're moving to new cities to create those connections and help them have that peer-to-peer support and help them find the resources they need. And we did, we did that in Vinica, which is the location that we're in where people are sharing resources. There are volunteers that are sharing resources on the platform and having, before we decided to do this, we talked with several international, large international organizations that work on this. And they just really were not able to, to, to move that quickly. They did not mm-hmm. have team in Indonesia. They were not able to use existing platforms that they built in, in Ukraine. I'm sorry. And mm-hmm. what we, yeah, what, and, and there's research that's showing that there's a tremendous amount of international, um, money that's flown to that that's come in to address the ukraine crisis much of it is not being spent in ukraine and yet 90 yeah. percent of the work is being done by mm-hmm. volunteer organizations in ukraine and so how can we really get more support and resources to these organizations that's really again i mm-hmm. i see like if getting visibility of these internal organizations that are doing the work and getting them resources. This is the, this is, this is what's needed um, yeah. that we support the, the neighbors who are already there on the ground creating this change. And so I think that's been, yeah, it, mm-hmm. it it's definitely been a different situation. But, I mean, I would say that, and one of our board members always says there's no natural disaster. Everything yeah. is man-made. Yeah. And, and yet this is, this, this disaster has, a number of other things that we had to really think about before going in, in terms definitely following all of the the regulations in terms of what can be shared on the platform Mm -hmm. uh, and and making sure that ensuring safety and security of of folks, that that those were things that we wanted to really ensure. Ensure, yeah. yeah. And I think you brought up a really good point there about how much of kind of traditional, the traditional kind of charity model of emergency response. I mean, charity in general, but especially in emergency response, the, the money does not flow through the communities that are the most impacted by those disasters. That's, that's I think, one organization that I think is doing a really good job of showing another way is World Central Kitchen, which goes and helps to support the local businesses, give them give them the ingredients if they don't have access to it, pay them for the creation of the food. And and it's, an, I think, a really good model. I mean, there's there's been so much criticism, especially I think one of the most well-known examples is in Haiti, where all so much of the money that's been got that's that's gone towards supporting Haiti has gone to international NGOs and very few houses have been rebuilt. And the impact on the ground has not been felt by the people themselves. And one thing that I'm now really interested about, maybe we'll do a follow up at some point in time, but finding out kind of how that support looks for in- internally displaced peoples. I know last year in 2021, there was 38 million people that were internally displaced, 0.4 million coming as a result of conflict and violence and just under 24 million by disasters. And here, here's an example of, of the conflict and violence, but you know, Right now, I think there's close to 60 million people that are internally displaced around the world. And so there is a huge need for connecting people when they are displaced, getting those, making sure people are able to, to find the available services that they need to be able to survive and thrive in the new locations that they're being forced to be put into. And as we have more and more of these massive climate disasters that we're going to, even if we do everything right, we know that we're going to have more of these before it starts getting better. 
we have to start to really kind of think about how we are going to mitigate the secondary harm that comes after these disasters, that comes after these displacements of, of those imp impacted communities. And this seems like it may be on the pathway to, to be one of the answers to that question. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we are, we're just scratching the surface on the need and we were able to, we don't have the name brand of these international yet of these <laughs> name brand international organizations. And yet we were able to, in a few weeks, have the platform up and running in a language that it's not Roman characters. There's a lot of, there are a lot of issues, but it's, yeah, I, I think that, and, and we were able to do it because we got a few individual donors that supported mm -hmm. it and that's great. But the, the need is, is, is massive. And I not only want to have the platform serve as a way to be able to see these local organizations that are doing this work and get them resources, but also as a way for people to, and this is kind of how we're now thinking about, we're, we're sort of moving towards this in Ukraine, is having people on the ground be able to use it as a Yelp for these mm -hmm. services. There have been a lot of issues in terms of human trafficking and gender-based violence and issues in, in the Ukraine situation because the majority of people that are in transit are, are women and children. And we want to create a way for their voices to be heard. Like, is this service working? Like, did this actually reach me? So that we can get more, yeah, we can increase the effectiveness of the aid that is flowing to Ukraine. Yeah. So, I'm wondering kind of what's what's coming next. What are you what are you working on right now and and is there other places around the world that you're working to expand? Yes. So we are very interested in this climate justice alliance. So creating living living forest economies and it uh, after this COP and the tremendous urgent need that we have on this and the tools that we have available to create from the bottom up these solutions that governments and other, the carbon market and companies can start flowing money directly into people's pockets. And that's really the first step of a vision called the Plentyverse, which we're working to build. So it's the exact opposite of the metaverse <laughs> in every way imaginable. So rather than sowing conflict and division and a virtual world, it's it's about connection. It's about getting resources, driving resources to things of real value on earth. The people that are protecting forests, the forests, the it, it's, it's changing the economic system to flow to things of real value through and mediated through a very simple tech platform that's focused on, um, yeah, the people that need it most. Yeah. And is there anything you, else you'd like to share before we and this interview? Yeah, come check us out at myconnect.org. And yeah, we'd love to collaborate. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us on The Response. This has been an interview with Mina Neopin, part of our biweekly series that is now available on both podcast and videos. And as, as Mina said, please do visit Atma Connect to find out more about their work and to access their growing list of tools and resources. And make sure to subscribe to, to our YouTube channel here and then follow the Response Podcast on Twitter for as long as that's a thing and Instagram. And you can find out more from us and listen to past interviews and audio documentaries, including the ones that I referenced in the show today by visiting thereponsepodcast.org or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you in two weeks. Until next time, take care of each other.